Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Lara. I'm a um, system security engineer from Stuttgart, working at Bosch. Uh, this is my um, uh, first DNOC, the second time non-remote. Um, last year's DNOC, I um, noticed that um, the, work, the field I'm working in, automotive networking, is uh, relatively unusual for DNOC, but the people seemed interested in it, so I submitted this talk, and um, yeah, now I'm here. Um, in my free time, I'm a volunteer at Selfnet, where I help uh, uh, connecting the dormitories in Stuttgart uh, to the internet. And um, I'm currently studying for my master's degree in computer science. So, um, let's start with um, use cases for automotive networking. Um, why do we even need this? Um, of course, there are many different use cases in a car. Um, different uh, functions um, have different requirements. and um, so there are um, different technologies in vehicles. And first of all, there's um, control data and safety relevant data. That's for example for driver assistance systems or um, a powertrain, um, uh, for example, for powertrain easy use or in general, just safety relevant um, data for, um, yeah, for example, for the brake system. Um, here we need a really high, really high um, robustness, um, about medium bandwidth, and it should be low cost. Um, another use case would be um, real, uh, low speed data, uh, for example, for um, electric window openers or electric seat control. Robustness is not that important here. Um, we don't have um, high bandwidth requirements, uh, but it should be very, very low cost um, to keep the prices cheap. Another use case would be infotainment. Here we have um, audio or video streaming or navigation systems. Um, uh, this requires uh, a lot of bandwidth, um, about medium robustness, and as always, low cost. So for these different um, use cases, we have made different uh, bus technologies or bus systems in, uh, in the vehicle environment. Uh, for example, at the low cost, uh, low bandwidth end, we have uh, LIN, then we have um, different CAN versions, we have automotive Ethernet uh, from 10 base T1S up to uh, 10 G base T1S, which um, obviously offers a lot of bandwidth. And um, yeah, all of them have uh, their um, advantages and uh, downsides. So for this talk, I want to focus on um, the low level protocols, um, mainly three, uh, three of these bus systems, LIN, Ethernet, and CAN. There are of course a lot of other protocols that build on top of these, um, but um, they, they, are, they could be a topic for another time. Okay, so let's start with having a look at the local interconnect network, or LIN for short. It's a hierarchical bus system, so we have um, one uh, commander node and up to 15 responder nodes. And um, it's um, relatively cheap. It only, uses, it only needs one wire for transmission. And um, its uh, operating voltage is at about um, 12 volts. So the driver here looks um, relatively simple. You have the um, LIN line, the um, one wire where it is transmitted, disconnected over pull-up resistor to the battery voltage. And um, yeah, the serial communication interface can, read, from, uh, can re read the voltage level from the LIN line. And to transmit data, it has a transistor where, where, which it can use to um, uh, pull the line to ground. Um, how is the, how the signals in LIN encoded? Um, the logical one is the high level, and logical zero is the low level on the bus. Um, high in this, in this system is uh, recessive, and low is dominant. So if multiple nodes would be sending at the same time, um, the dominant signal, the zero, is what would be um, transmitted. Um, the thresholds, when something is considered high and when something is considered low, depends on whether you're the sender or the receiver. As a sender, uh, um, everything above 80% of the battery voltage is considered high, and everything up, uh, below 20% is considered low. As a receiver, everything about 60 per, uh, above 60% is um, considered high, and everything below 40% is considered low. It's a good example of Postle's law. Um, be conservative in what you send and be liberal in what you accept. It makes the system more robust. The header... Uh, <laughs> The frames in LIN are split in two parts, the header and the response. The, um, 
Uh, the header starts with a uh, thick break field, which is at least um, uh, 13 bits uh, dominant, so um, zero. Then you, there's a delimiter field with, with one um, bit set to one. There's a sync, um, there's a sync byte, which alternating ones and zeros. Uh, this all helps with uh, synchronizing the clocks between the different nodes. And then we have a protected uh, identifier, which consists out of six bits um, for the identifier specify which uh, node shall answer, and two parity bits. Afterwards, the response is, um, is up to eight bytes of data and a checksum, which is the inverted eight-bit sum with carry. Um, every byte in, on lin gets two additional bits added to it, a start bit and a stop bit. The start bit is always uh, zero, and the stop bit is always one. Okay. So, as I just said, the um, frames are split into two parts. The header is always sent by the commander node, and uh, uh, the response is then sent by a responder node that was um, uh, identified with the um, PID. So, for example, the commander nodes uh, can send a node um, with the ID of um, a node 2, the node 2 would be responding, and then the commander node can send the next header um, so another node can respond. Um, this um, makes sure that only one node speaks at one time, but it has the problem that without, uh, without the commander node, nothing works. The commander node becomes a single point of failure here. Okay, then. Let's have a look at a more um, robust protocol, CAN, um, or the controller area network. Uh, th this bus system uses two lines, um, CAN high and CAN low. And these two lines are, are connected to our uh, termination resistors, which are usually about uh, 120 ohms. Um, the exact value depends on the version of Ken. With Ken, you can, um, depending on the version, transmit between about 1 Mbit per second and uh, up to 20 Mbit per second. In Ken, the uh, signals are transmitted by um, comparing the um, voltages of Ken high and Ken low to each other. If there's a high difference between these two um, lines, then um, this is, is um, interpreted as a logical zero, this is a dominant signal. And if there's a low difference between these the signals, then this is um, considered as the one, which in, in Ken is the recessive signal. Okay. Uh, frames that can um, start with the arbitration phase, where um, the node sends uh, its identifier. Then there are some control frames. Uh, some control bits, for example, um, uh, RTR value, remote transmission request, where a node can um, request another node to send something. Um, then the, you'll see the data length content fields, um, which specifies how long the frame will be. Then we have up to uh, 64 bits of data, uh, CRC with 16 bits, um, the acknowledged fields, which um, the um, uh, nodes that's sending always sends uh, recessive, but the other nodes can uh, overwrite it in order to um, confirm that uh, this node was uh, received successfully, and then seven bits to mark the end of the frame. Um, the exact length of, the, uh, of a can frame um, depends a bit on its content, because um, if, if, we, if you have uh, five bits of the same polarity, you always add another bit with swap polarity. So for example, if you send five zeros, then you have to send another one. The one is not interpreted for data, but uh, you need this um, as a signal on the CAN bus. So, if this is not a hierarchical bus system, how is decided who gets to talk? Um, for this, um, each node at the start of uh, the at the start um, at the start of a frame, they send their identifier, and the identifier is treated as somewhat as a priority. So. Uh, let's look at an example. Uh, an example. Um, in this example, node 1, node 2, and node 3 all want to send at the same time, so they start. Um, they start with the start of frame bits, that's always zero, then they send a 1, everything's the same here, so um, on the bus there's the 1. Then they all send a 0 for the identifier, and then we have the first um, a case here where one node sends something different. So node 1 and node 3 send a 0, and node 2 sends a 1. And one is the recessive signal in the can, so on the bus there's a zero. Nodes two notices that it's sent uh, one, but it's uh, read uh, zero from the bus, so it knows somebody else is sending at the same time. 
Now, nodes 2 stop sending, and we'll try again later. Now, we still have two nodes um, uh, trying to send, so this continues. Up until later, now we once again have a case where uh, node 3 sends a 1, and node 1 sends a 0. Um, 0 is the dominant signal, so the 0 is on the bus. Node 3 sees this and stops sending. Now node 1 can continue sending without even noticing that somebody else wanted to send, and the other nodes um, wait until it's their turn, until, another, until um, they have the highest priority. So um, the, in the end, uh, the ID is uh, somewhat lacking priority, and the lower the um, ID, the higher the priority. Kedden is a relatively um, robust protocol, so let's have a look at how it handles errors. Let's, um, let's say for this example, node 1 is sending something, and um, nodes 2 and node 3 are just listening right now, so they start with um, the recessive signal on the bus, so they um, don't interrupt anything. So node 1 here in this example sends a 1, 1 is on the bus, it's fine. It sends another 1, and now it reads a 0 from the bus. That means something here went wrong, um, it's not the arbitration phase, so there can't be anyone else sending something. So it knows this bit error, and now, it's, um, now it signals uh, an error. Uh, errors in um, Ken are signaled by sending mm, six bits of the same polarity, so either six ones or either um, six zeros. Um, for error frames, you don't add um, a stuffing bit, so um, it's really then six bits of the same polarity. So node 1 now sends these um, uh, six zeros, and now nodes 2 and node 3 notice that something went wrong because they can see that there, um, there's a stuffing bit missing. So now they themselves send the error frame once again, um, six bits of the same polarity. In this case, they both send um, uh, six zeros. And afterwards, every node in the network noticed that something went, went wrong. The um, frame where the error occurred is um, interrupted and um, the bus in a state where um, the sending can start again. Each node counts uh, their errors, and depending on uh, how many errors uh, they observed, um, they switch to different states. Um, a node usually starts in um, error active. In this state, they send their error frames uh, as dominant bits, so they send six zeros when they see an error. That means they can interrupt other frames. If they encounter too many errors, they change to error passive. In error passive, they still can send um, error frames, but they send them as recessive. So they can interrupt their own frames if they notice that there was an error, but they can't interrupt other frames anymore. If they then still continue to observe many errors, at some point they will change to the bus off state. In this state, they, they completely remove themselves from the bus to not interrupt the communication any further. So if there's a defect on the node, at some point it will um, remove itself from the bus to um, not cause um, more damage. At the same time, the counter uh, gets um, decreased for every successful um, transmission. So for example, if, an, uh, if a node is in error passive and then the, um, the error stop, then it can return to error active. OK, so now let's have a look at a third uh, protocol. Automotive Ethernet. Um, automotive Ethernet uses um, a single unshielded uh, twisted pair, and uh, depending on the version, the, uh, it offers different bandwidths. Uh, the version I want to now look at is um, 100 base T1, so the 100 Mbit version. Um, automotive Ethernet is, um, well, in this case, um, 100 base T1 is full duplex, so both nodes can send at the same time with the full bandwidth. And uh, to do this, um, they need an error cancel an echo canceller uh, in their um, files. So they send and receive from the same line, but they uh, filter uh, the signal they send themselves from the signal that's on the line to um, figure out what's the other signal that was sent from the other side. Then they can receive it and um, forward it uh, to the software that will work with, with the signal. Um, 100 base T1 uses PEM3 encoding. That means there are um, uh, three different um, states that can be signaled on the bus, um, one, zero, and minus one. 
and always uh, two, two signals on the bus are then interpreted as three bits of data. So for example, um, one one would be interpreted as the data bits one one one, uh, one minus one would be interpreted as one zero one, and so on. Okay, the frame format of you probably looks familiar to you. It's um, usually e Ethernet. You start with the uh, preamble and the um, uh, then you have the um, destination address and the source address. Um, you have the uh, length, length type, then the data, and the, and the frame check sequence. Um, the exact length uh, depends on what you're using. For example, if you're using VLANs or something, it gets a bit longer, but um, that's just the usual Ethernet frame. Okay, now that we had a look at different um, bus protocols, let's have a look at uh, how this is used. Have a, let's have a look at the different um, network architectures that are used in vehicles. Um, first of all, the distributed architecture, which is um, the traditional one, then the domain architecture, where um, the industry is currently at, and the zone architecture, where it's currently moving towards. In, a different, in the distributed architecture, that is where automotive networking began. Uh, we have um, only a few ECUs. They are mostly self-contained, so there are not many. Um, there's, a, there's not a lot of uh, communication going on. And it was uh, possible to just connect uh, whatever needed to, to talk to each other. Um, sometimes there was already a gateway, so something like a switch or a router, but it was relatively simple and relatively low traffic. When the networks grew more complex and the, you had more easy use that needed more communication between them, at some point you needed to structure the network better. So the domain architecture came up. In the domain architecture, you grouped easy use by the function and um, you add some additional easy use, domain easy use, where you can centralize some functions. This um, has the advantage that you have a logical structure of the network, um, easy use with the with the same domain, for example, uh, powertrain easy use or um, infotainment easy use are grouped together. But it still is different, has the disadvantage that these easy use are distributed all over the vehicle, and so you need a lot of, uh, lot of wires. To, um, uh, to solve that problem, the industry is now moving towards a zone architecture. In a zone architecture, you no longer group the physical network by function and instead by position in the vehicle. So for example, you have a front zone, a rear zone, a middle zone. Um, you can still do a logical grouping, for example, by using VLANs or some other virtualization technologies. And um, the um, centralization of some functions continues. So you have zone ECUs where you can uh, pull together some functions. And um, now you usually have um, vehicle computers, which are um, much bigger than uh, gateways. Um, they still have the routing and switching functions, but they offer a lot of, m a lot of more functions, and you can um, uh, collect especially um, uh, functions with a lot of um, uh, performance requirements there. Okay. So um, now that we have a, had a look at all of this, let's uh, sum it up by um, building our own example architecture. Um, let's build a modern architecture. So we start with a vehicle computer. And um, we want a zone architecture, so we add some zone easy use. For this, ex this example, we'll use um, four zones. They are connected via Ethernet to the vehicle computer because this is our backbone network. We need a lot of bandwidth here. Then we need a connectivity unit. Um, this is our um, uplink, for example, via LTE. Um, this gets more and more important uh, since um, cars are getting more and more connected. You have some cloud functionalities uh, in, in modern vehicles, so you need internet connectivity. Um, so we connect this uh, to the vehicle computer and um, also via Ethernet because we need a lot of bandwidth here. Now let's add some other control units, for example, powertrain ECUs, brake systems or airbags. Um, this is connected via CAN. Um, because we have safety relevant functions here, so it needs to be robust. And um, maybe you want to reuse some older easy use that only can speak can, and it's, um, it uh, allows for more reuse if you use the um, older protocol that's, uh, that was already there, and it still works fine. Then at the end, let's add some sensors and actuators. For example, um, yeah, the electric window openers or um, 
or a seed control or something like that. Um, it's not safety relevant. It uh, doesn't need a lot of bandwidth. So we're using Lin here because um, it's cheap. And with that, we have a, a small um, example architecture. Of course, in reality, the, um, um, the networks in cars are much more complex. There are much, many more easy use. But this is a small example that maybe gives a good overview. OK, with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have some questions, you can ask them now or reach out to me later. You have some contact data of me here on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lara. Are there any questions for Lara about car networks? Yes, I see one hand. Please state your name and your affiliation, if you can. Christoph Badura, self-employed. So how many uh, sensors, ECUs, and so on are we roughly talking about? Oof, um, by now, there, there's really, really a lot of I don't have the exact numbers, but I think it was uh, it's definitely, I think it was in the 10,000s. Uh, if, if you really count small sensors, then it's a lot. It's really, really a lot. Wow, impressive. One more question. Please state your name. Yeah, yeah Chris, uh, Christian Frömmel from Charité in Berlin. Yes. Um, are the, the security functions from the CAN bus, are they connected via Ethernet? Um, are, so are the security functions reliable or rely on Ethernet? Uh, security or safety? Yeah. Safety. safety. Okay. Um, uh, it depends. You, um, it's possible to um, um, uh, tunnel the safety relevant frames over Ethernet as long as there's an additional um, header that's um, use end, to end protection in a safety sense, then you can tunnel them, for example, over Ethernet. Any more questions in the audience? No, I didn't see anyone. Is there questions from Venulus? No, there is no question. Then I have a question. OK. With all the equipment in the cars, what's the next evolution of you know, 100 megabit? Will, will there be something more uh, for bandwidth? Because I guess it's the traffic is growing. Where's the future? Well, uh, so again? Where's the future of, of bandwidth in the cars? Well, for bandwidth, um, you already saw on the um, overview slide, there's um, already 10 gigabit Ethernet available. They are currently working on um, CAN versions, which offer, mere, which offer more bandwidth. And um, uh, yeah, so that's where it's a moving bandwidth-wise. There are, different, there are a lot of different protocols that are built on top of that. For example, for, um, um, for Ethernet, there's currently standardization going on for MagSec, so we can um, uh, already secure the frames there. OK, thank you. Well, it's a lot of evolution in the car. I remember someone, there's nothing happening in cars, but you know, you, you, taught, us, uh, you taught us something else. So with that, thank you, Lara. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for uh, sharing this information with us. Thank you.